Sounds familiar? <laughs> Same music you heard yesterday. And uh, there's a mix up with the designation uh, for the music that I intended to play both yesterday and today, but we go ahead. It's all right. Uh, those are the Jazz Crusaders, and uh, it's an old uh, song, but it's fine. Life works like this sometimes. This is Lead Stories. I'm Eutrice Lead, and we pick up from where we left off yesterday. Today is part three of the discussion that we've been having, and that is, what would you say are significant or the most significant issues and developments that we experienced in this current year, which is soon to finish, 2018? And what is your view about where things are likely to go in 2019 that we should begin discussing? Um, we're doing this because at some point we have to deal with the reality of the situation. From what we have uh, observed and noticed of this president and his administration, there isn't very much power people have, ordinary people have, over what happens, what uh, the, the kinds of decisions that are made, how they're made. Uh, we have an administration that is very uh, chaotic, the president being at the top of that food chain, where anything is likely to happen at any time. Uh, it has provoked a great deal of anxiety, even within his administration, but certainly uh, among the citizens of this country, really, really upset. And it has spread throughout the world. Many heads of state, many countries are concerned about the kinds of behavior, uh, the kinds of decisions that this president uh, is making. And they are on pins and needles about it. Because don't forget, a lot of this trans transfers to the, the, the international community as well. So we have a problem there. The people of the United States, study after study, is showing that people are descending into pits of depression and anxiety. A lot more people are seeing therapists and whatnot because the, the, the air of uncertainty is very thick. People don't know what is likely to happen. We're getting dire predictions from many quarters of our world with people who uh, spend their lifetimes studying trends uh, indicating that we've been on a downward trend for a long time now since the president took office. And people are worried. They're just are so worried. We just had a recent study indicating mass movement of people within the borders of the United States, but they're moving from one place or to, to another, hoping to find, more than anything else, some serenity. They're looking to reestablish themselves in a place where they think they can get a, an opportunity to take greater control of their lives and things are not as chaotic as they are outside of the locations that they choose to go to. So it is not a good time uh, and yet we get these reports of how fantastic things are going in the business sector. And Trump boasts about the lowest unemployment rate ever. He's talking about, you know, the bouncing back of the economy. Of course, this is all due to his unusual and insightful leadership. 
And therefore, we are left asking ourselves, what do we call this period? What do we call it? When you have such a wide range of reactions and you see the reports are consistent, people are very, very uh, upset because they feel uncertain about what's next. And yet they feel certain that the president of the United States, one way or the other, is playing an unusually large role in their lives without asking permission to do so. They don't have the power to lock him out. They don't have the power to control him. And the people they've elected, likewise, they, they talk, they call news conferences and issue press releases and so forth. But in the end, there is no extraordinary amount of power that they have exerted to compel things to turn out differently. It's a steady descent into hell and chaos. And while people are trying to, you know, give the impression that, well, they can weather the storm, and we have that kind of talk going around as well, that we've been here before and we can tough it out because that's what American means. We're a tough crowd and we can, we can deal with whatever comes because in any event, we can always bomb it. Whatever it is that, that we feel like we can bomb, we got bombs. So we have serious firepower, literally. Just the same, we have to look uh, at our community and how it has been behaving in light, not just of Donald Trump, this precedes Donald Trump. There have been yawning contradictions in the so-called progressive world where, for example, the Clintons got a pass, Obama got a pass on many things. And now we have a barrage of criticism directed at Trump. And the question is, well, wait a minute, where were you? When all the negatives really began, and even now, as we point the finger at Donald Trump, we have to acknowledge where it began. It began with lackluster leadership, chaotic leadership, especially within the Democratic Party. We had contradictions. We had an infestation of corruption. We had people who were more concerned about their own political futures. We had a party shot to hell and gone bankrupt. Don't forget all of this. These are legitimate criticisms. And now to compound the insult, they add injury. And that is, we're supposed to set aside the very recent past and the role that the party had played in betraying the interests of the people. So while it is true that Donald Trump is no gift, it is also true that the progressives or the Democratic Party, the progressive party, you know, the, the progressive movement as it, as it were, uh, was not free of yawning contradictions. So they're not in a position to point at Trump and say it's all about him and what he did and what the Republicans did. We are too old to fall for that simplistic analysis of a very serious and complex issue. We did not hold, and we still are not holding the party to account. 
We have not held uh, any of the so-called progressive parties to account. And yet we see them mounting or attempting to mount a repeat of 2016. They want to run again. And we have people newly on board like Kamala Harris and Cory Booker, recent additions. They could hardly account for themselves and their performance in Congress, and they're ready to run for president. I don't understand what the heck is going on here. It's like there's a drug. Everybody's taking it. They can't wait to get their hands on, 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 on power. They're not qualified yet. And meanwhile, we have uh, Barack Obama sailing into his twilight, very well situated. I don't envy the man, but let's not be disillusioned. We have to discuss what was his response. Did he carry out his duties to the faithful? He did not. Mrs. Obama experiencing extraordinary success with her just released book called Becoming is now wearing $4,000 boots and is an icon of the fashion world. Well, good for you. I, I'm glad that you, you, you're reaping some kind of uh, benefit from the work you put in. But while you're strutting around in your golden uh, boots, we have some serious problems out here that you are absolutely not paying attention to. And it still continues that the job of the masses is to pay homage to you. All you fine Democrats who screwed up and feel no further obligation to take the people out of the abyss of hopelessness now, of joblessness, of homelessness. So it is an obscene kind of opera that we are caught in. And what fascinates me is that people are silently dealing with these things while overtly it's as if the insult is thrown back in your face and you're supposed to shut up about it and pretend it's not an insult. Pretend that this is not abandonment. So we'll talk about some of that and whatever else you see as issues that we need to talk about, especially in this new year, we have lost momentum, we have lost time, and we are still looking for answers to come from outside. We're looking to see what solutions they have. We do not have the luxury of waiting. And even if we had time on our side, we shouldn't waste it this way of sitting by waiting for people to come up with something that might work. They don't know what they're doing any more than, than we can show ourselves the way. So I am saying that part of the exercise, if we are going to achieve anything, is we have to be real clear. We have to have clarity about who let us down, how, and why. And if I might add on to that, we have to punish them. But that aside, the overarching duty that we have is to ourselves and what I say all the time, survival. They are no longer part of our survival, if they ever were. They're not part of our survival. 
precisely at a time that we have a brewing, deeply entrenched crisis in housing, the African-American housing uh, secretary, Dr. Ben Carson, has nothing to say. He's not seen anywhere. He has no uh, solutions. He, uh, no, we're not hearing what's happening in the world of housing. And this is what I mean. He was selected specifically to be the front man. And that's all. He has no power. And he has no intention of exercising power, even if he had it. Barack Obama has to be called to account. It's not that I, I dislike the man. It's not, nothing personal in that sense at all. Although I did not vote for him, as you know. In either of his two terms... Because I saw early what his response was to Africa. He went to Africa as a presidential candidate and started wagging his finger of blame in their faces, lecturing them as if they didn't know what their problems were. He didn't go there with a plan. He didn't go there with a suggestion. He behaved like any white president we've had. And then comes the, the series of feeling good projects. I'm glad that he's concerned about young children. And that he has these charitable organizations that would help give some of these young people a leg up. But that's not the answer. Makes him look good. Mrs. Obama's answer was to build basketball courts in Chicago. Really? And we let her get away with that nonsense. Barack Obama's answer to the educational crisis was to appoint one of his buddies with whom he played basketball who had no credentials whatsoever to be Secretary of Education. So I'm, a, I'm not at all nostalgic about that. And if we are going to achieve some modicum of success in moving forward in meaningful ways, we cannot let people off the hook. We cannot let them off the hook. They owe us their allegiance. Because we created the potential and possibility of power for them and the party. So everybody has to account. And everybody has to be made aware that we're not playing. We have played, when it comes to us, we've been dilly-dallying for a long time. Thinking we're safe thinking that we are protected by virtue of our political investment. There is practically nothing going on in our communities that is consistently right, consistently successful. And so we get nowhere. Because one of the the key ingredients to success is what? Consistency. You have to be consistently successful. But if in the course of a presidential uh, term, you're changing 
direction and you changing philosophy and you changing all kinds of things at a whim, it means that you are part of the problem. You are actively uh, conducting warfare against communities that are very, very uh, precarious. And you are actually destroying the chances of success when you do that. So let's talk at 888-874-4888. And let's get something done this year. Most importantly, let's get our thinking overhauled. We have some stinking thinking. And it has, it has blocked our success. It has blocked everything that we're trying to achieve. People have now fully regarded themselves as sheep. They're the sheeple. Waiting for instructions as to what somebody thinks they ought to do. But it has nothing to do with the aggregate interests of the people. It has to do with people worrying about what's the next step in their career. What next should they try? The assumption being that whatever it is they try next, you and I, the sheeple, will back them up. Even though we know they are making no commitments at all. No commitments at all to delivering on the things that we so desperately need. We have to change our way of thinking. The time has long since passed. It's long overdue that we change our thinking and that we adopt a very fierce allegiance to our survival, our collective survival. We got to get in that mode. 888-874-4888. Let's hear what you are thinking, because once we get into the new year, we want to move along. And I've got to tell you that some people may get a little bit angry because we are not going to adopt the old ways of thinking anymore. They're not working. They're not working. So why do we continue down that road? Let's get some new ideas. Let's get some new philosophies. Let's open our eyes. And let's get some our brains in gear about what is possible that we can achieve, absolutely achieve. Instead of going through this rhythm every four years, you're going to get a change as a different face in the, in the place. And we confuse that with progress. For the vast majority of people in this country, it's a cruel joke. It's a cruel joke. And at some point, we have to respect ourselves enough to say, I would rather eat nails than be put through this, this uh, ridiculous exercise in non-power. We need to have our, our muscles flexed. And we need to do some hard bargaining. We need to do some very serious thinking that has nothing else in mind except our collective survival. That's it. That's it. We don't have to apologize for it. We don't have to make excuses about it. We don't have to seek permission about it. We just need to do it. Because as we continue to discuss, we see the progression of the attacks. We see the pervasiveness of the attacks. We see the generational effect 
of these insidious attacks, I, they call them attacks, it's, they call them policies, but these are attacks on our communities. And they don't get corrected by attending the next policy meeting, by waiting for the next press release, which is riddled with lies and misrepresentations. They get remedied by, uh, by doing hardball politics. Hardball. Don't take it personally, but I aim to put your lights out. Simple as that. You have consistently underperformed. You have created crisis upon crisis in our communities. And you have taken no responsibility whatsoever. In fact, you use the, the failure of your policies to make the case that you're not stringent enough. You're not tough enough. The poor are responsible for poverty. The homeless are responsible for homelessness. This is your logic. You put the blame on people for suffering the conditions that you create for them. All right, enough talking. Let's get some thoughts going. 888-874-4888. I know that this is an unusual kind of exercise where we actually are forcing ourselves to engage our brains and to engage and commit ourselves to action. But this is what we need to do because as part of the criticism I have, as I just said, is that we've given ourselves every possible rationale and excuse for failing to do anything about our condition. We, we don't stand up. We don't advocate. We don't take uh, action. We don't seek remedies. We just sit by and talk about how terrible things are, having no participation in the solution. So let's get solution oriented. Let's get some ideas and put it on the table so people can't say, well, we didn't think about that or we didn't know about that. All right, let's take a little break and come back to your thoughts right after this. And it's all about talking about what we need to do. My mind is a fine mind. My mind is a right mind. My mind by divine mind. Divine mind. Far follow my mind. I even am trying to cheer you on with uh, Jimmy Cliff with his song, If I Follow My Mind, from the 1976 album, Follow My Mind. That's the whole point. You have a mind. We all have a mind. And our thoughts, our thinking is, I mean, it's, it's perfectly legitimate. And we have to assert ourselves. We have to, to jump into the conversation. And we have to take charge at some point about the things that are happening to us. And we have to take charge in terms of formulating a response. Is this going to work or not going to work? You know, we be sitting by and watching things happen. And I guess the most recent uh, occurrence that I've been talking about is the taking of uh, communities of color, retaking 
throwing people out, buying the, the houses and homes and buildings from under them. And people are still telling me they, you know, on the air, had a conversation with a man who I think is quite, you know, conscious. He, he, he can talk quite capably about the issues of the day, living in Harlem, and was trying to communicate to me that he didn't see. He didn't get my point of view. It might be over-exaggerated. And the very next week, we had a $145 million sale of buildings in Harlem, a couple of buildings. Just a couple. That's the kind of wealth that has been in Harlem this long. And we haven't seen people fight for it, to protect it. Ron from Connecticut, you're on the air. Hi, Atrice. Hello. I really don't even know where to start. Well, pick a place and, got, and go. I got some bullets for you here, you know, uh, some notes I made, but I don't even really know where to start. Uh, it's like, an, you know, it's another Great Depression. It's an old trick, but they're even better at it now. They're bigger and stronger and better, and they've whittled the process down, this this uh, conspiracy between really evil lawyers and evil bankers and business people. In the, you know, uh, so uh, brand new Congress, I'll say it again, brand new Congress. It was a movement before the midterm elections that got absolutely zero traction. How, do we, how are we going to network? We, we, we have similar needs. There's a lot of left, right issues that are, you know, that as Ralph Nader puts it, you know, that are nonpartisan issues. Uh, how about, okay, besides brand new Congress, which could have some effect for 2020. How about the 16th we, Amendment? It is not, I mean, I, I'm just, I'll be very I, frank with you. Yep. That does not ring in my head as feasible by 2020. It wasn't feasible by the midterms even though it was launched over a year before. But you're talking about a brand new, con well, let me ask you, what's your definition yeah. of a brand new Congress? Uh, fire everybody and replace them with working people, with people. Oh, who well, you know, be, let's, let's talk about things that are realistic and accomplishable. You cannot fire everybody and put, quote, the people in by 2020. That is I'll tell you right off the bat, I think it's impossible. And you, it, and you shouldn't you entertain have. ideas that are just plain impossible. Right. Let's do but something that's you. within our ability to accomplish. There's no point in, 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 in uh, indulging in ideas that, that are so far-fetched that as to be almost a fable. Well, let's see what uh, 100 new progressive Congress people can do. A lot of people are optimistic. But uh, I'm sorry, I don't think we can really work very much with the system as it is. So it, it's illustrative of the problem when you get some people thinking, we need a brand new Congress. But you know, leadership is not just in Congress. My point is that leadership is on your block. Leadership is yeah. in your community, in your schools. Yeah. Leadership is, is where you live where you work. So when we Spot continue on. to put the emphasis on Congress and they will solve the problem, they cannot Thank and you. will not. Thank you for pointing to the right source of the solution. Local. Right there. The 16th Amendment. I want people to think about that. And people should think now in terms of a tax revolt, public referendum, national strike. That's what that's how bad the problem is. We should be thinking in these terms. So we definitely need to wake up the sheeple. Yes, but you see, we need to wake up the people differently. Hmm. We've been sloganeering for a long time. 
But if I were to ask anybody, what is a plan? What, is, what do you think is a workable plan? They don't have one. They've never thought of one. They can't produce one. And we've been going through these problems now for decades. What is the plan? Mm. And why can't we arrive at a point where we agree that we ought to have some kind of a plan that addresses our concerns about day-to-day -day survival in this country? What is so hard about that to get? And it needs to be a coalition, locally and going up. Coalition approach is the only approach, you know, uh, uh, the rank voting that was suggested. It has to be inclusive. Government needs to be inclusive. Can't be this, you know, Government winner takes needs all to be life. many things, but nobody is in a position to compel government to be what it ought to be. Correct. We just had an election in Florida. We had another election in Georgia. Both of them lost. It's not that they didn't do the right thing. It's not that they didn't try hard enough. It is that the system was so crooked. Mm -hmm. it, it actually uh, ran roughshod over the constitutional rights of all voters in those two states. What did we do? We sat around and, you know, we, we commiserated, but that is not the solution. The solution uh, is action that keeps yes. this thing in focus until it is addressed and solved. And now we're going to wait. Even the candidates themselves yielded to the pressure that they should just suck it up and move on and then, you know, figure it out for the 2020 election. That was not the answer. The answer was that these elections were rigged. The answer mm -hmm. was that people got elected who should not have been elected and people were deprived of their win although they earned it the fair way. And somebody had, should have gone to jail for that. Somebody should have been indicted for that. But we all sat around and said, oh, isn't it a pity? No, it's, uh, uh, no, that's, that's not a solution. Somebody has got to pay. That's where we start. When there are errors uh, or we find out that there are planned errors like this, somebody's got to pay. Somebody's got to go to jail. Somebody's got to be brought before the entire nation and be held accountable for an unspeakable thing. Well, until the people in a position to do that have a change of heart or a change of consciousness, nothing's going to happen. Who, what agency is going to apply that tool, that lever, that hammer? How do you abandon an entire corrupt system in an organized and peaceful way is really the question. And people individually have to organize their own thoughts before they can get organized with other people. Well, here's what, here's what I, I see. There are all kinds of impediments before we even address the question. People are really clear about what the impediments are. Nobody has said, you know what, let's just get started. Mm. Let's just get started. And start yeah, it in a wait. serious way. We may not have all of the answers, but we have one big uh, question that we aim to have answered. And that is, how is it that we could permit uh, this young man in... in uh, Florida, Gillum, to lose an election, spending all that money, all that time, all that effort. How do we allow Stacey Abrams to lose? And we all, you know, we all go back to what we're doing. We see no connection at all between these acts of treachery and these crimes 
with our ability to just live as, as citizens in a country that says it respects constitutional rights. So we're playing games. We're playing, we are playing games on ourselves. We know that we don't intend to, to see this fight through. We know we don't intend to fight, but we just talk about it. Nobody's mad at us. Speaking of constitutional, the 16th Amendment, which I mentioned before, if people look it up, if it's still online, Aaron Russo, the Hollywood director, interviewed a retired commissioner of the IRS. It's very interesting because Aaron points out in the 16th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States that we are not to be taxed for our labor. Our well, wages listen, should you not know, be you're taxed. You know, yeah. you're going down the road of conspiracy theories, and I'm not. That's an old tired argument that has been raised time and again. And it, even when it initially was raised, it was raised not as a people's issue, but a white people's issue. If it were raised as a people's issue, we would be framing that argument in an entirely different way. But they don't see black people, they don't see Latinos, they don't see Asians as being part of the people. We're just supposed to listen to what they say, do what they tell us to do, and then we would have fulfilled our commitment to change. I'll get out of here. Those are tired arguments. They should be shot at dawn. Take all these arguments, put them up against a wall, and shoot them all down in the morning. Thanks, Ron, for your call. Uh, Harvey from Brooklyn. Well, Berkeley, you're on the air. Hello, wonderful, Eutrice. Well, because I'm a renewable energy guy, I believe that a good place to start this change, change for the better, is to look at our use of, uh, of fossil fuels and uh, that it's killing our world. It's really, it's affecting all of us on uh, all over the planet, not just in America. And uh, if you follow the money, uh, and they say follow the money. The, the Trump administration is a fully owned subsidiary of the fossil fuel industry. He, he's a global ch climate change denier. And um, I think that this is the, the energy game is the biggest business on the planet. Uh, we, fight, we fought wars over it, and we continue to fight wars over it. Our military defends the fossil fuel industry because they run on fossil fuels, the Iran War, uh, the uh, United Arab Emirates, um, all of it, so much of it is based on our use of energy and maintaining that structure. And I believe that now is the time for us to take the initiative. And have you ever heard of something called blockchain technology, B-L-O-C-K yes. chain technology? It was invented by IBM, and it's basically a new form of ledger. It's, an, uh, it's a keeping account of things in a very secure way. But it has many, many uses, and um, one of the uses is that it can be applied to our use of renewable energy so that... But, but let, me, let me interrupt you here for a yes. second. Yes. Uh, I understand where you're going, but I want us to concentrate t today and in the next couple of days... Let's talk about what needs to be done. Who should be leading the way on this? Who should be taking the initiative? The people who say, you talk about the Green Party. Why don't we have a constant uh, barrage from the Green Party and supporters of the Green Party to, because this is not a thing that individuals can do by themselves. This involves legislation. It involves all kinds of political changes that have to, to be made. And it involves uh, uh, shooting down things that don't work, but nonetheless have incredible amounts of support that are wreaking havoc and have been wreaking havoc on our environment for a long, long time. That is the, the fight. The fight is real. We have to roll up our sleeves and fight. 
But I don't see, I see people talking. But there is a fight on our hands. We just had, uh, just to depart for a little minute, we just had the second child die in U.S. custody waiting to be processed along with their parents, two children, a boy and a girl. One was taken back home to be buried without her mother. And, you know, just life goes just, life goes on. So are we serious and committed to immigration reform? Is this something we're willing to fight for? Or are we just willing to talk? Well, I feel that besides Progressive Radio Network, that the major forms of media that would that are supposed to inform us and keep us abreast of of uh, these issues in a way that is positive for the for all of us uh, is actually controlled by the same people who who run the game who run the political game in terms of again its control of the energy which controls the world and I feel that the we're stuck in this kind of mode where we're not really um, given any power. In fact, we're made to, to feel powerless. You know, the, the onslaught of news and so much of it, although most, a lot of it is m- most probably true, but the onslaught of news keeps us all in a state of, of, um, of weakness. It's just too much, and, and, uh, and by the end of, say, reading a newspaper or hearing a newscast, you don't know what to do. You're just sort of left like, oh, my God. But the thing is, is that that's why I particularly take so much time to focus on the one thing that I feel will make a big difference, and that is changing over our our fossil fuel form of energy to renewable energy, and that'll give us more strength in our battle to fight all the other issues, because I believe this is the predominant one. I mean, if we have climate destabilization and a runaway greenhouse effect, there won't be a planet. Uh, we'll just we'll just go the way of Venus, where the surface temperature is hundreds of degrees and the oceans boil off. So that's why I focus on this. But again, those who have the money are in position to control the media and control our use of of, uh, of energy. And so I'm saying that the use of blockchain technology will enable us. It's a new form of technology that will enable us to, on a personal level, like for instance person with solar panels on their house can sell power to their neighbor next door. We have a tendency to centralize both the generation and production of power, and this is our downfall because, say, we, when we have blackouts, uh, whole areas go down, but if we were to take our individual vote with our dollars and buy electric cars and put solar panels on our house, then if the grid goes down, we're still in action, and we can supply energy to our neighbor who who doesn't have to suffer from a uh, a, a energy blackout as well. I think that where the key. Is this, where is this working right now? This model. Where is it working in practice and working and producing exactly the results that you described? Yes. Well, it is working with the. There's a Bitcoin, for instance, uh, Bitcoin, the new currency. No, no, no. no. But is, is where? Blocked. Geographically, is this working? Uh huh. Well, I can't actually tell you where, but I read in the other day that the Bank of America has adopted several blockchain policies for its corporate structure to uh, secure information about about uh, about the financing, you know, the the movement of money and all that. And this this is a uh, an overall blockchain technology is something that can actually bring things down to a level where right, but pe- you, people we, are we're still control. talking in the, in the theoretical. I want to know, so far, yes. in, in, in the sense that this is a topic that has been circulating in this particular uh, sphere, let's just say, people who are into energy and so forth, they kind of have been discussing this. Where does it exist where people can be pointed to and say, see that project over there in Phoenix, Arizona? That's our first completed one. And 
uh, is working just fine. And yeah. we have a prototype. Where is well, their prototype right now? I would recommend then that, uh, th- that your audience do what I do, is go to Google and search for just that. I don't have the information at my fingertips. I've been studying this for a while, and I think that the application of it will empower um, us and, and help us gain a, a handle on, on uh, controlling our environment. Um, you know, the, it, it turns but, out but that... But listen to what I'm saying. Yes. It's a great idea. It's probably quite viable. It is probably quite profitable in the sense that it would save people a lot of money and all these good things. But it is not enough to say that, okay, these, these are the ideas, and now you're going to have to fix it. No, part of the leadership has to be taking on the responsibility to produce a prototype that people can be directed to, People can experience it. They can travel to Phoenix, Arizona or Kalamazoo or wherever it might be and experience it. But we've been talking in theory all the time. Mm -hmm. And people don't buy theories. You know, it's advertising. You can't tell a guy, you know, this is a great pair of shoes until those shoes are on his feet. And he's walking in these shoes and he experiences the luxury of these shoes, the comfort of the shoes, whatever it is that you're selling. Then everything else that you're talking about is just talk. This is my complaint about uh, across the board. Let me let me tell you decades down the, the, the line from all kinds of people who said they have brilliant ideas. Show me a working prototype. Well, let me tell you where you've you've tried something and it succeeded. Let me tell you one thing that it has application for, which is directly related to everything you're talking about. You know, we talk about artificial intelligence sort of taking jobs away, um, but one job that people feel secure with is politician. Well, that may be on the line too, and I'll tell you why. With blockchain, it turns out that Right now, the way we work is that we vote for representatives, and those representatives vote on issues. And if, uh, unfortunately, due to the world of financing, it takes a lot of money to become uh, an elected official. So companies like the fossil fuel companies, they finance these politicians. And then when a crucial vote comes up, they say, well, you know, we're calling in our, our, uh, our uh, favors now. We want you to vote this way. Well, that works against us. But... With the blockchain system, there is the possibility that we can all, with our devices, vote on issues directly, directly, because it's a secure way of voting. From your lips to God's ears, I'm seeing if an idea is good, get it working. That's, That's the job of the people who have the great ideas. You know, here was a great idea. There's a very... Uh, People call it a primitive way of banking. It's prevalent all throughout uh, Africa and the Caribbean. In Trinidad, we call it Susu. And that is a group of people who organize themselves into a group, a banking group, except that they do banking very differently. They take turns drawing the entire pot of money. And there's somebody who manages the group. You know many homes have been bought through Susu? They've never gone to a bank. And in, in New York City, where redlining was so prevalent, it didn't affect them. They bought homes, they bought cars, they sent their children to the finest colleges, all on Susu money. It got to the point where the banks now established Susu accounts in order to take the practice under their control. And there were people so stupid, really. You invented the thing. You run and you give it to the banks, and now the banks have control over a financial system that had been in play for at least 200 years. It's... Yes, it's primitive, and the people are not educated, and 
And, you know, they're so simple. They can't see the benefits of you know, the big picture. Yet, they've started businesses. They've, as I said, they've bought their homes. They've done everything that a regular bank absolutely would not fund, would not allow them to do. They've been doing this for years, very quietly and without any supervision. Just a group of people managing their money as a group. Now the, the, the banks in Brooklyn are encouraging people to start SUSU accounts with them, and people are actually gone. This is the problem we have. This is a problem we have. We, we are not able to communicate to people and show them the, the practical application of their genius and what it could do for them. Thanks for calling. And that brings us to the end of our program today. These are serious discussions we ought to have. And we ought to understand that again, the number one imperative is our collective survival. If we miss that point, we might as well just lay down and die. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. Never, never could do wrong Baby, if I follow my heart I'd live by emotions In my every notion It will lead me astray now Each and every day now Baby, if I follow my